Hello and welcome to the MD310 Medical Care Provider class. This session's topic is medical legal topics, legal areas that impact your practice of medicine. By the end of this session, you'll be able to define abandonment in terms of taking care of a patient, define consent, define negligence, and since negligence is the basis of medical malpractice, you'll be able to list and define the four legal elements necessary to establish negligence so that you can avoid negligent claims on your part. Your practice of medicine at sea has been around as long as people have been going to sea. The U.S. Public Health Service was actually founded to provide hospitals for mariners on shore and to support medical care at sea. The Jones Act of 1920 defined employers' obligations to provide medical care for mariners at sea, which establishes something of a legal setting for your practice. And the IMO uh, establishes specific levels of providers, those who have completed elementary first aid, those who have completed a medical care provider class, and those who are medical persons in charge or med picks. And then the U.S. Coast Guard implements those regulations and standards in the U.S. The practice of medicine often depends on medications. And so the U.S. FDA established in 1980 a statement that more or less says it is important for ships to have access to appropriate medications and that they would do their best to support pharmacies and ships in terms of putting a ship's medicine chest in place as long as pharmacies and uh, those shipboard did their best to reasonably ensure that the drugs are going into the medicine chest and are being used appropriately. So let's talk about the first big concept of medical care, and that is your scope of practice. And that outlines the care that you are allowed to provide to the patient. There are many different standards that establish a scope of practice. Probably the most important ones for you are the IMO's STCW guidelines, the objectives that in fact shape this course, and the U.S. Coast Guard's interpretation of them. The provider that you receive your medical control from will also establish limits to what are the outside limits of the things that you can do for patients. Now, somewhat different from scope of practice, this is the concept of standard of care. And it's how a reasonably prudent person with similar training and experience would act under similar circumstances, with similar equipment, and in the same place. It's a legal term of art. Essentially, juries decide whether you've met the standard of care, whether you behaved as another reasonably prudent person would in your circumstance with your training. You actually provide standard treatment, which is a little different from standard of care. But either way, it establishes essentially what you need to do. And there's lots of places that the, the standard of care can come from when a jury decides whether you've met the standard of care. There's local custom. So what do people do with similar training and experience? Do you have protocols which you may get from your medical control provider? And if so, what do those tell you you need to do? For an EMS provider, their standard of care is in fact their protocols. They can't do more than the protocols say, and they need to do what the protocols say they do. Your practice is generally a little bit looser, but protocols do play an important part. And then what other factors would influence people practicing in the same location, the same local custom. Location, uh, inherent hazards, and crowds if those are a problem. There are also professional standards. So if you are doing cardiopulmonary resuscitation, you will be held to the professional standards of the American Heart Association. IMO also uh, through the, their textbook on the ship's medicine chest and aid at sea. Uh, and the U.S. Public Health Service text will give you 
guidelines as well and set standards. Wilderness Medical Society will also set standards that are relevant to your practice. And then there's what are called institutional standards. So what others in the industry would do, and again, the IMO really sets those standards. Now, you can do a lousy job in taking care of someone and not necessarily be negligent. Negligent is a legal term of art for describing when you don't do what you're supposed to do or you do it wrong. And there is simpler ordinary negligence, which is a very low standard. It means you were supposed to do something. You made a mistake. It wasn't intentional. But there are some courts that hold you to a simple negligence standard. So any error is malpractice. Many courts use a gross negligence standard, which states that you not only were you negligent, but you acted in a reckless manner with foreseeable bad consequences and despite knowing the potential for those consequences you went ahead and you acted anyway in a manner that someone reasonable and prudent never would really consider. Now to prove negligence you need to establish four things. You have to have a duty to act. That is you are required to provide care in the shipboard setting, unless you have a very specific order not to be involved in a patient's care. If you're a medical care provider, you've got a duty to act. And that that's limited by the fact that you do not need to put yourself or the crew or ship at risk to act. And so if, in fact, you are watch keeping and in a critical situation and then someone's injured, you don't need to put the ship at risk to take care of them. But otherwise, you're pretty likely to be called upon at any time to provide care. So you have that duty to act. Then there has to be a breach of duty or a failure to act. And that can either be that you didn't act when you were required to. So you were told about someone who was injured was your responsibility to go take care of them, but you decided you weren't going to, so you didn't. Or you acted inappropriately. So someone had an injury, probably a fracture of their leg, and you didn't splint them. And that's something you should have done. There have to be damages. If somebody isn't injured, there's no negligence. So while you can screw up doing what you're supposed to do, if it doesn't hurt anybody, it's a near miss, not negligence. And finally, and this is the real key um, to defense attorneys at any rate, you have to be able to establish causation, which means basically you have to be able to prove that your breach of duty caused the damages. And without that obvious relationship, and sometimes it's not so obvious, um, but without that relationship, there is no negligence. And that's where expert witnesses come in and discuss whether or not it's likely that what you did or didn't do caused those damages. If the damages were going to happen no matter what you did, there's no negligence. Or if you did something entirely wrong but the damages were unrelated, there's no negligence. Now you may also run into issues of abandonment and that's when you stop providing treatment without a patient's consent. Now if you've taken care of someone in the sick bay and they're better, and you're essentially discharging them, that's not abandonment. That's completion of the relationship. The patient says, good, I'm feeling better, thank you very much, and essentially are giving you consent to not treat them further. And so you finish that relationship. Now, you can also terminate care without provision of continuing care. So while you don't tell someone, I'm not taking care of you anymore, you leave them without making sure that there's someone else to take care of them. And if they need ongoing care and you don't make arrangements for someone to provide that ongoing care, then you've abandoned them. And then finally, you could hand someone over to somebody who can't provide the appropriate care. So someone who's taken elementary first aid, if all the patient has is a broken arm and needs a splint, Someone with elementary first aid can probably put a splint onto their arm. So having them do that is not abandonment. If, on the other hand, the patient needs oxygen and possibly IV therapy, 
and you turn them over to someone who's not trained to do that, and the person has injuries because of that, then you have abandoned the patient. Now, everybody has the right to say whether or not they're going to be treated if they have capacity for decision making, which we'll talk about. And we'll start by talking about adults. So any person over 18 years of age who's not under a court-ordered guardian is considered an adult and is considered to have the right to make their own decisions. They can make what's called actual consent, where you tell them what's going on, what you're going to do, and that you want to provide care for them, and they give you permission, either verbally or written permission, and then you provide care for them. Or there's this concept of implied consent. So if someone is unconscious or they can't communicate and you think they have a life or a life-threatening illness or a life-threatening injury, it is assumed by the courts that normal people with decision-making capacity would want you to provide care for them. And so you can go ahead and provide care for them. You have their consent. You hopefully will never be involved in these situations, but there can be times when a court orders care. You've heard about people with forced feedings. That's court-ordered care. And then there's some issues about getting consent from the mentally ill. As long as they have decision-making capability, they've got the capacity to make a decision. That is, they understand the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives. And they're able to express those to you, and they're able to make a decision based on those known risk, benefits, and alternatives. Then they have the capacity to make a decision, regardless of any other underlying medical or psychiatric illnesses. Adults, of course, also have the right to not let you take care of them if they have the capacity that we just discussed. So they understand risks of treatment, they understand benefits, uh, they understand what the treatments are, they understand alternative treatments, they are able to tell you these things, and they then can refuse uh, for you to provide care. If that's the case, you want to get them to sign a refusal of care and have a witness sign it as well. Or, potentially, if they refuse to sign a refusal, document that and have somebody witness that they refuse to do that. Hopefully, you won't have to treat many minors, but it's a possibility. A uh, minor is defined legally as anyone under the age of 18 who's not been married, or uh, has not had their minority status changed by the court, or hasn't served in the military. And so, for people who are minors, while they take part in their decision-making, uh, the law states that actual consent needs to come from parents, guardians, or other closely related individuals who are adults. Again, the implied consent uh, rules apply, so if there's no adult around and there's a life or limb-threatening condition, then you can go ahead and treat and you'll be supported. What gets tricky is when a minor doesn't want care, uh, the guardians have the right to refuse care for their children unless that refusal would be considered an immediate life or health risk equivalent to child abuse or child neglect, in which case it becomes a legal issue. Hopefully you won't have to face that. What you're more likely to encounter is a minor who gets injured who does not have a parent around or a guardian. So there's no one else who can make that decision for them. And then you have to make a decision about whether or not you think they're, they've got capacity and document that uh, if you think that they do. And if they don't, then tell them they cannot refuse the care. Uh, and again, if the care is refused, risks, benefits, the treatments themselves, and the alternatives must be discussed, you need to document that and obtain signatures and witnesses. So what happens if you take care of someone who you did not have consent for care? Well, you're committing assault and battery. Assault is unlawfully placing a person in fear of immediate body harm without consent. People are allowed to tell you that they can, they can be hurt. And in fact, when we start IVs on people, IVs hurt. So they may have a fear that they're going to be hurt, but they give you permission to do that therapy. If you don't have that permission, that's unlawful. That's assault. And if you actually touch them or do anything to them, that's battery. So make sure that you have consent or that the implied consent rules exist be before you begin treatment of any patient. There are some concepts of immunity. That is, you are not liable for your actions. 
the government has what's called sovereign immunity uh, based on the concept of the king is never wrong. And so if you're working as a governmental agency uh, for a governmental agency or as an agent of the government, then you are immune or at least indemnified by the government, um, which means that they'll support you if there is a uh, action against you. There are also these so-called Good Samaritan laws. The issue with the Good Samaritan laws are, first, they don't prevent lawsuits. And if somebody sues you, you have to defend yourself. And if your defense is the Good Samaritan law, you still have to pay your defense attorney, which could be upwards of eighty to hundred thousand dollars, just to get you off based on a Good Samaritan law. So don't count on that. Uh, they offer a defense for those who act in good faith. So if they felt you weren't acting in good faith, you were acting for some other reasons, and you didn't meet the standard of care, uh, then you're not immune. And here's the really tough part. Typically, they only apply if there's no duty to act. So if you're shipboard and you have a duty to act, there is no Good Samaritan protection for you, typically. This would most likely occur uh, or apply when you're on shore and you stop to help someone who's ill or injured. And they don't protect against gross negligence, so you still have to meet the standard of care. You'll need to fill out records and reports of your care. They need to be complete and accurate. They need to be legible so that others can read them, and they need to be neat, uh, both for communicating medically so that when a patient gets flown to shore and comes to my hospital and I see them, I can see your record and understand what happened and what you did for them. And also because if there's a bad outcome, uh, an untidy or an incomplete record is considered evidence of poor care. And plaintiff's attorneys hammer on that to juries, that if you can't even document right, how could you possibly provide good care? And it is a legal document as well as a medical record. Patients have a legal right to privacy, both at a federal level through uh, some laws that apply when electronic billing occurs, and then almost every state in the U.S. has a separate Patient Privacy Act that basically says that you can't share information about your patients, uh, personally identifying information, and their medical information uh, unless some exception applies. And the exceptions that are important to you are that if you're giving care and then you pass that care on to someone else, or you've passed care to someone else and they contact you to get more information, as long as it's involved in continuing care, that's fine. And if you're ordered by a court, or if the patient says, I want you to share this, this medical information with someone else, my doctor, my physical therapist, my attorney, whomever, uh, with a signed information release. But if those conditions don't apply, don't talk about patients, particularly shipboard. It's a small community. Everyone will know who you're talking about and what's going on. And people have a right to have their health information kept private. There may be some special re reporting requirements that you are involved in. Uh, the, these five are ones that likely have a higher likelihood of applying. Childbirth. Uh, you need to record the appropriate information and then find out who has legal jurisdiction where the childbirth occurred so that you can report that birth to the appropriate authorities. Death at sea needs to be reported, and particularly burial at sea. And while burial at sea is discouraged, uh, it can happen, and there are some very specific requirements for what you need to do, which we discuss elsewhere in the course. And workplace injuries, uh, both employers and often regulatory uh, safety and health agencies will have requirements for reporting. And then any injuries that occur during the commission of a felony need to be reported to the appropriate authorities. Hopefully you won't have to deal with too many of these. If you come upon a patient and there's a crime scene, you want to do your scene survey for safety, document what you saw, provide care, but preserve the scene as best as possible, and report what you saw to law enforcement. And if you can, secure the scene as well so that no evidence gets disturbed. You may be involved in sexual assault cases. And with the patient's permission, you can give a report to law enforcement. Now, sexual assault is an, an interesting medical issue because it's really a crime with potential medical implications rather than a medical emergency with an incidental crime that's occurred.
So you need to retain and preserve any evidence to maintain a chain of custody. You need to secure any evidence that you collect uh, to make sure it's not tampered with. You're not going to be doing forensic pelvic exams, but you may be collecting the clothes um, that were you that were the patient had on at the time of the assault, which may have physical evidence on them, and you need to make sure that the purity of that evidence, the chain of custody of the evidence is maintained, and the ship's master should have a process for helping to do that. Hopefully you'll never have to deal with child abuse or elder abuse, but if you do, just report to law enforcement or the person you're handing the patient off to or other agencies that may be involved. Don't accuse, report your observations only, and all of the child and elder abuse statutes in the U.S. at any rate have immunity if you reported this in good faith. Okay, we're now going to review a little more information on your own and then take a brief knowledge review to make sure that you understand what we are discussing here.